All right. You probably had enough of the open API stuff, and you want to get into the the other part of docs. I used to call these non-reference docs, but I never felt that was quite the right term because it was like describing something in a negative of what it's not. So I changed it to conceptual content in API docs. And if you have a better name for it, let me know. But this refers to all the other stuff in a user guide that isn't the reference documentation. What is all this stuff? Well, there are at least nine core conceptual topics to cover actually at least eight that are very specific to API docs and one that I think is just a best practice. But the, almost all API docs have these or they should have them. Um, <clears throat> an API overview, a getting started, authentication and authorization, status and error codes, rate limiting and thresholds, code samples and tutorials, SDKs and sample apps, quick reference and glossary. And we're going to go through each one of these. Um, may, maybe not, well, I'm trying to remember if I included glossary or not. But I've decided to shake things up this time because, um, first of all, like, it gets to be very tedious to be in uh, kind of a workshop lecture mode, right? So in this section, we're going to shift our minds around and it's going to be more inductive, inductive reasoning. And you're going to be a judge to look at three different examples of each of these different concept doc types, the overview, getting started, and so forth. I've chosen three examples from different API doc sites. And as a group, <clears throat> uh, it's not like I'm going to have you do this individually and then report back or anything. We're going to, this is going to be more of a discussion interwoven throughout. But we're going to talk about which one of these is best and why. But I'm not gonna try to force any kind of theory down your throat to kind of set the criteria for why one would be best. I want you to tell me, and then from that, we'll draw what should be our conclusions about the criteria that each of these concept topics should adhere to to be best in class, okay? All right, so this first, this first one, I mean, I have to briefly describe what these concepts are, but the API overview, it's usually on your home page. It's kind of where people get started. It briefly tells you what the API is for, who's it for, what market case it solves, or what pain point it solves, why people would use it. Oops. And there's three that we've got. Okay, so this, by the way, um, <clears throat> there are links to this. You're gonna need this, this one. This is section five, conceptual content in API docs. There's just one activity, but it's got all the links that you'll need. This first one, API overview. I've chosen three API overviews to look at. <clears throat> Yumly, Edamum Food Database, and Lyft. I didn't all choose the same genre, right? So here's Yumly, Edamum, and Lyft. So spend a uh, few minutes just looking at these over at the overview and then tell me which one of these three does it best and why All right so the links are right here in activity 6a judge conceptual topic content can we did that points for that editing <laughs> um when you're trying to extrapolate what makes a good API overview and, and who's doing it right. And so yeah, if, uh, you've got comments there. Take another minute here to arrive at your winner and be prepared to defend it. <laughs> yeah, you gotta pick the one that does it best. I don't know, or just have something to say. Okay. All right, so which one did you pick as the best in class for API overview and why? Somebody want to stake out a claim? In the back, yes. My reflex is about doing a lot of analysis, the Edamon one. Okay. And why? All right, so, so you want to see use cases covered. 
and explicitly spelled out in the overview. All right. Anybody else? Yes. I'm kind of torn because I think some of them have plus or and minus, but I, the Yumly, I really liked the section on potential applications for the Yumly API. Mm -hmm. That that really kind of gets you thinking about how you can actually use the API. Yeah, what are the potential applications, weight loss, tracking, allergy? Do you get a clear sense of exactly what you can do with Yumly from this? Or is this still kind of very well, I think the big. other ones did a better job of getting directly to the... To the meat of what, the, they're, yeah, what they're things about? What they're doing. Maybe Yumly is too big to distill into that? I, I think what you're saying is it focuses on use case, where I'm constantly thinking, like, how are they going to use this? And it does focus on that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? I think a different approach here because Yumly is taking the marketing effort like mm -hmm. let's get you excited and then dive into the details whereas the other ones are just kind of like the mm. here are the details you know I some people just need a little bit of um, hold, hand holding to kind of like PLM you know, get oh. PLM. <laughs> what what is it that would get some get a developer excited to use an API like can you pinpoint anything that would Something you know <laughs> Okay. I mean, Yumly's definitely got a lot of graphics, and they've got a visual designer working overtime on this. Uh, <laughs> but. Or cut to the chase and tell me exactly what it's for. And so maybe if you're critical of young, young Lee, you're thinking it doesn't cut to the chase quick enough. Well, if you actually put the documentation in more of a cut to the chase overview, so I think if they kind of layered it out. Oh, OK. That was what I was trying to say. Oh, this is interesting, huh? Yeah. Good, good call out. Sorry, what? Lyft does a good job. It's very concise. It's very, what is it? Why use it? Glossary access. Lyft gets minus points for having gray text, though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You're an, <laughs> like, <laughs> this trend towards gray text, no. <laughs> yeah, I hear you there. Well, I feel like there's a very kind of simple job that an overview should do, and that is that it should tell you what you can use the API for, and yet it seems very difficult. For example, Lyft. Exactly what? Do I do with this? That's what I was saying. I didn't want to ask that. Oh, easy. I transport my customers with a smile. Yeah. Is this for people building apps for Lyft? I mean, Lyft already has an app, right. and it already has drivers. So are there, are there third parties who are building tools around Lyft that pull in rides? Like, I'm not really sure. Um, Yeah, but why? Okay. Give me an example. Why would that be? Why, Ryan? What would you do with that? Steal their credit card numbers? <laughs> 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 Maybe you wanted to do some like data visualization, right? Like tracking, you know, the amount of traffic, lift traffic in, hmm. say, the Bay Area versus New York. Yeah. Right? But why you'd want to do that, I don't know. Well, my if you were yeah. Uber, you might really want to track what <laughs> Lyft is doing. <laughs> That's right. Well, but now, even with Edamom, um, you know, it tells you, provides you with tools to find nutrition and diet data for foods. So does that mean if I want to find out if uh, a certain food is, you know, low in sugar, I'm going to be able to use this? It is somewhat straight, more straightforward, but it's still kind of vague. Like, uh, I guess it does say covered use cases. It will tell you what it does. It won't tell you why you might want to do it. But yeah. I, think that, I think the food database would appeal to developers more because it, it gets into hard details faster, mm -hmm. whereas the others are kind of eh, hand wavy, yeah, you can do something cool with mm. it. But you, you run up against this, this sort of introduces this other problem in that you have a, mar you have a marketing group, a developer marketing group that's going to have, that probably is responsible for Yumly's homepage, I'm guessing, right? 
And so you've got this marketing presentation to developers, and then you've got the API overview. And like, how are the two different? How should they interact? And what's the transition? I know AWS has this issue. It's like you've got all these, the marketing layers, the first layer, and then you get into the documentation. So the documentation kind of repeats stuff that's in the marketing layer. It's a little bit of a, of a challenge, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this one other than um, <clears throat> my take here is that, uh, I, and I guess I don't really have a clear winner either, but um, I think there's an important, there's import, an important point to address. First is, can you intelligently and simply tell a user what the API is for? Second is, can you tell me what pain point it's addressing in the market or in, in a company's life? And uh, there's a lot of, lot of companies developing APIs, and many of them fail. And why do they fail? They don't really address a pain point very clearly. Um, I've got a quote that I want to read from. Top 20 reasons startups fail. Startups fail when they are not solving a market problem. We were not solving a large enough problem that we could universally serve with a scalable solution. They had great tech, but they weren't solving this pain point. And so I think the overview, in addition to kind of covering the use cases, should kind of revolve around this pain point because that's the story of your app, right? Stories revolve around conflict. What's the pain for which I would seek your, your API as a solution? Anyway, um, but at the very least, at least tell me simply what it does. So many times we, we work with teams for months, and of course everybody knows what our product does, and they, you know, all our customers know, and then you just jump right into the docs without, it, without ever really explaining what it does. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Anyway, all right, let's go to the second one. And you probably saw this in a lot of these, like um, get started and so forth. Uh, this is another huge, core topic to cover, how to get started with the API. And we've got three contenders here, Parse, PayPal, and Google, all right? So this is number, number two here, Parse, PayPal, and Google. Take three minutes and tell me which one is doing the best job at getting started. All right, so which one did you like best? Were you raising your hand or stretching yeah, it? Yeah, no, okay. both. I vote for PayPal. Um, and why? It, it, seems, it seems very clear, it, and it, it gets to the point quickly, and it has specific steps. Do this, do this, do this, do this. The ad sense was like, well, if you don't know what this thing is, go read this, and then if you don't know this thing, go read that. And the parse was, I don't know, I, I didn't quite understand exactly where it was going. It was like, well, there's some prereqs, and then it's best if you have a server on a thing, whereas <laughs> the PayPal was like, do this, do this, do this. So it cool. just felt like, okay. as far as getting started, and the other problem with the with the uh, the parse is they already recognized, is that the one that had a quick start after, one of them had a quick start after they're getting started. Oh. Oh, that was. No, you're right. Parse has the right. quick start, and then the getting started, it's a little... And it was just like, all right, well, we've got getting started, and we already know that's not going to work, so here's quick start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Yeah, the quick start jumps over to GitHub, too, so it's like you're in a totally different site. It's like, uh. So you like the specific steps, the clear destination, and kind of walks you through this. All right, anybody else? Yes. I found it really hard to pick between Google and PayPal, honestly, they're both really scary. They feel really direct to me, but I think so it's visually, I prefer Google's a little cleaner. Okay. But, yeah. I agree with Gina. So. I mean, with Google's, you, as um, Greg was pointing out, there's a lot of sort of things that you might need to read first, and it's, mm -hmm. it, at the very least, it's kind of telling you the big pieces of what you need to square away, your ad sets account. It, which is like, okay, these are the things I need to do, right, whereas I found that one to be the most skimmable of all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the sense of being able to, to pull the whole process into your mind at once, uh, even if it's a very simplified version, uh, is really kind of essential to how we learn. 
It's kind of like a, a book. You open a book, you see a table of contents. It shows you the whole of it, and then you like go into all the details, right? Well, this quick start is kind of that same way. It t walks you from beginning to end at least, so you know, oh, I've got to register an app and get an API key, and I need to construct the base URL and add my path and get my response and done or something. Anybody, anybody else have any thoughts on getting started here? Yeah. The other one, ten parts, parse, was it called? Yeah. I mean, I don't even know what that is. So yeah. Like yeah, and this this almost relates to um, this idea of making every page a starting point. It just assumes that people maybe started at the overview, where maybe they detailed this, or the home page, or somewhere else. But if I land on this, let's say I Google get started with AdSense, I land here, then I'm like, oh well, wait, do I need AdSense, or how does this differ from? 17 other Google products in the ad space. There's no link to to that. Yes. It seems like all of them could really use a graphic. Yeah. The, like a diagram a or a flowchart. Flow okay. Flowchart or a block diagram or just something hmm. kind of laying out the pieces of an advance organizer, if you will. Um, however, you want to do your advance organizer. But. Yeah. Actually, um, there's. One that I used to have on here that actually had that, it was a IBM one, and it was it was kind of cool. I, I should dig out the link here, but uh, I do like the workflows. Let me see if I can just grab it real quick. Anybody else have any comments on the getting started? They want to share. Let me see if conceptual. Yeah, Watson and IBM Cloud. So, eh, no, never mind. Not showing what I thought it had. We do a lot of these where we have like a little diagram at the top of the screen that has like, like what are they called? Subway, subway stop diagram? Oh. Something where you've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five across the top oh, of the page. Yeah. And you can see visually, okay, I have five things to do, and I'm currently on number two. Mm. And then as I scroll down, okay, now I'm on number three. Just yeah. some, some visual structure around, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Big picture. Yeah, I mean, developers usually want to know the scope of what they're getting into, right? Like with this parse server, like, uh, who knows if this is a multi-step process that will take months, or is this something I do in 10 minutes? It's like... It's not very clear, and that, that map does give you that scope. I just wanted to point out a couple of things here with um, getting started. They're very similar to kind of the Hello World tutorial in the programming world, where you want to try to get the person having some kind of output in a simplest possible way. In, in, in programming languages, they even have a metric, and they say, how long does it take me to, to output Hello World using your platform? Well, you can ask the same thing. How long does it take me to get the minimum, simplest thing from your service? It will require me to go through all the steps, and then I can build from there. Another cool, interesting tool is that um, Postman actually has this little button uh, that you can embed. It gives you this snippet of code called Run in Postman. And when you click it, it will allow you to import a set of calls with Postman, directly into Postman. If I click Postman for Mac, it'll pull in, um, I've already got this, so I'll just import it as a copy, but it will pull in a whole set of collections over here. So you could integrate this into a getting started tutorial to kind of jumpstart the process and say, you know, uh, import this Postman collection, you've already got the weather API configured for this city, and you can see all these different scenarios. Uh, you can see this didn't, quite import the way I thought, but you get the idea. Um, there's, a, there's this whole thing called the Postman API network, which supposedly shows how hundreds of different companies are integrating Postman in their getting started tutorials or other tutorials. A lot of them have that Postman button. Okay, 
Now let's jump over to API authentication and authorization. And our three sites we've got are SendGrid, number one, Twitter, number two, AWS, number three. So tell me which one is doing the best job at the authorization section and why? <laughs> wow, ouch. Ouch. I told you, you need to call them up. All right, so, so why don't you go forward and tell us why, why you don't like the AWS one, or what are they doing wrong? I just looked at it, and it just starts with signature required, timestamp required. I don't even know what that means yet. In the context of words being used, not just thrown at the beginning of the page. <laughs> Well, what about the, first, the cool, the first cool? Step is you construct a request to AWS. First of all, that's not how we write. And second of all, I don't know what that means. Okay. What about the diagram down here? They, I mean, it's it's using it. Start out with this big old U block. U in <laughs> red. But I mean, they've. It looks like a complicated method for for uh, doing the request. You <laughs> to give him his your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's too. It, they've made the. Yes, request is authenticated. No, request fails. <laughs> this section describe, describes the. So they've taken something and made it out to be way more complex than users want. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can see that. I mean, it's it's visual and all, but it's like, oh, I just wanted my API key, man. I don't need all this. Yeah. All right. They uh, already warned us that they're going to tell us that the section describes how the API uses signatures, not how I use the API to do something. It's it's already saying I'm going to describe how the product works. Okay. Not how to use the product. So it's that whole the the flaw where people are focusing on details that aren't necessary for the task I want to do kind of thing. Other comments on the three? What do you think? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Greg? What do you think? Well, we're big on minimalism, and mm -hmm. as these guys will tell you, they get hammered a bit, but yeah. we should tell them as little as just enough information for them to achieve their goal. So we've identified who they are, what their goal is, and we're going to give them just enough information to achieve that goal. And then we're done. You know, I have, I, I was recently thinking about this exact question um, in light of the whole Boeing plane disasters. You know how Boeing planes had this feature, this uh, maneuvering control automated system, MCAS, that would kind of adjust the pitch of the plane uh, automatically, but they didn't tell the pilots that they had this feature. It was just supposed to work invisibly behind the scenes. And then all of a sudden pilots are like, ah, the plane's pulling down, pull up, and they pull down, and then they crash. Um, raises this question of, well, presumably this thing should have been working. They shouldn't have needed to know anything about it, right? But now everybody's freaking out, they're like, yeah, you should have told us about this feature. So it's kind of a difficult thing. It, in many cases, yeah, you, you don't tell people stuff that they don't need to know because it's not really relevant. Background engineering noise and information. But what if, what if uh, some of these people deem that the risk might actually be severe if they don't understand certain things? I don't know. Well, that's a question of what they need to know. We've identified who they are and yeah. what they need to know. In the case of the pilots, they did need to know. Yeah. They did. So we made a mistake, we, the writer at Boeing, yeah. or the people at Boeing made a mistake with their judgment of what that <clears throat> pilot needed to know. But what they, you know, what they needed to know was, if the plane suddenly pitches down, turn this switch <laughs> off, turn that switch <laughs> off. And I'm sure the PM, the, maybe the writer was like, we got to tell them this. And the PM's like, no, that might create negative sentiment about things going haywire. <laughs> things are going to work. You know, this is the happy path. <laughs> Yeah, yes, in the back. You know, that, 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 that segues into a whole other discussion. I don't <laughs> want to get off the topic, but, you know, in Waterfall, it was more comprehensive. Now that we're 
in more of an agile path of just spitting out stuff just based on what's in a sprint, et cetera, et cetera. You don't get that luxury anymore of, of really trying to provide yeah. what you describe, you know, and, and it's beyond minimalism sometimes. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. You're right. The agile process is to be very minimal and only add as needed and, you know, definitely don't want to be wading through hordes of documentation. So, so yeah, as you do now, this sort of introduces the larger point about authentication. There are actually several different types of authentication that you've seen here and, and all three of these used a different type. How much do you have to explain about that? Twitter used OAuth. No, wait. Twitter used OAuth, right? And, you know, just for background knowledge, OAuth uses a, a separate identity server to authenticate. It sends back a token and then that token is added into your request to a different server. That's why, you know, you, you see these sites that are like, log in with Facebook, log in with Google. It's using those as an identity server. Um, do users, do developers need to know the details about how OAuth works? Probably not. It's super complex. They just need to know how do I get the token and what am I supposed to do with it and so forth. Uh, the other one, let's see, the AWS one used a t uh, an authentication protocol called HMAC, hashed message authentication code, which is used in more, in scenarios that need higher security often. Um, this, how does this work? Well, it's kind of like uh, your, your app talks to the server and they use a de uh, an encrypted language that is decoded by a key that your app knows and a key that your server knows, but uh, nobody else knows and only, your, only the resource server knows how to decrypt a certain uh, token that's sent along that knows how to um, take and decode the token into the special message on both ends that matches or something. You know, it's a, it's a complex thing that if you try to explain, mm, developers don't need to know. Um, but they may want to know what type of authentication it is. Maybe they're, Amazon yeah. Amazon perfect when they just said for information about HMAC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, link out, right? You don't want to explain common things. And then the, the most common one is an API key. I don't know if Twitter's was this or, or a different one, but hey, you need an API key and we put this in the header and then if our, our server recognizes the API key, you're, you're green. Um, and, and these keys just in general allow companies to shut off your access, to figure out how many calls you're making so they can charge you, right? Or to, um, to make sure nobody maliciously is trying to impersonate you and delete all your data or whatever, or, or do bad things. Um, but yeah, how much do you have to explain about the different methods? keep it as minimal as possible, I guess is the, what you guys are arriving at. You wanted something short and simple. So did you like Twitters then, if, if you wanted something short and simple? <clears throat> so you wanted, SendGrid had a lot of information, kind of like uh, how you delete your key, or the permissions, the replacing a, an old key with a new one, testing your key, editing your key, deleting your key. This is not meant to be right top to bottom. Right. You like kind of having a little more info, whereas Twitter was just like, here's where you get your key, done. All right, so there's a balance then, okay. Any thoughts or questions on this? Should we keep moving? All right, let's go on to the next one, API status and error codes. Uh, just to give you a sense of what these are, um, <clears throat> when you used curl to make that command that we did a long time ago, uh, let me go into Postman and grab it um, from, let's see. All right, when we made this request and nothing came back, hold on. All right, I just did a sample request using curl to example.org and I passed a parameter here that was like uh, to say, just show me the response header. In any call you make, the response header is gonna give a status code. In this case, if it's successful, it's 200 status code. If, it's, if the resource doesn't exist, it's usually a 404 status code. If some server 
copped out an error, it's a 500 code. These are all status codes. And so you need to document these, right? So look at the three contenders that we've got for how to approach this. We've got <clears throat> context, context IO, Twitter again, and then MailChimp, right? So take three minutes, kind of look at how they're doing it. And tell me which one is best. <clears throat> All right, do we have anybody who wants to <clears throat> say which one they like best? Go for it. I'm going over here. I like MailChimp because it says why you might be getting the error so you might get figure out how to fix it. And that's one thing I'm always asking is why do I care that I'm getting this error? Not that, that you're not telling me. I have no clue how to fix it. And yeah. I like it when you give information on what it really means. Yeah, I, I was just looking at this uh, 429, too many requests. It's not just telling you what's wrong, it's like y you've exceeded it. Well, there here it's like contact support for help. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it seems pretty obvious. You need to slow down how many of these requests you're making. But um, that's good, they, re they really do try to help you overcome the error. Other people? Wait, and behind you, Gianna, Gina, sorry. Uh, Mailchimp, and I, I just like how they like broke out the, the status responses from the error codes versus like the codes subset of the responses on Mailchimp, and I, I liked that they showed you an example of how it was going to look in JSON. So. Yeah, they've really um, you know, uh, they they break this out into status codes and error codes. This is a good call out, and the status codes tend to be more standard. If you notice, 429 is is too many requests in the Twitter, and on Mailchimp it was also too many requests. Right, 500 is a standard. So the status codes tend to be more standard and the error codes are more company specific. I don't, I don't really know that all companies have a bunch of specific error codes. Mm -hmm. Twitter's got a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and, and they're pretty informational, right? It's like, if you know the right error code, you can really pinpoint what's wrong, mm -hmm. which is quite nice. Somebody's gone and documented all this. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it goes beyond that. <clears throat> you don't just have a 404. It's like you got an error code 17 plus a 404. And now you know that it was because no user matched the term. You know, a lot of APIs aren't this specific. It's like you just get a 500 error <laughs> and you got to figure it out. They even have... I'm trying to figure out if one of these is made up. I think it is, but the 420, enhance your calm. It's like, I don't know if they're just having fun or if that's real. I'm having fun with that. Yeah. You can talk about rate limiting. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts? So what should be the criteria for, for developing a error and status pages? Anything, like any principles you would say? Or, sorry, did you have a different thought? Well, I was just going to say, I like the scannability of the Twitter one. It, it's, okay. it's easy to read. <clears throat> I agree, the MailChimp has some good information, but I found it really hard to read. Yeah. Just because like it's layout. just... Presenting yeah. it as a table is... Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, I think the scannability is huge, because especially if you have so many. Uh, even MailChimp, why, why wouldn't they put a little mini table of contents at the top that at least shows you what's on the page? You have to literally scan down. And they don't, they don't give you the success codes, just the error codes. Yeah. And they don't seem to have nearly as many codes, but um, yeah. Everything's on one line, too. And nobody's, nobody's pitching for the Clearbit one. This is well, I like one thing about <laughs> Clearbit, and it may be specific to their API. It, but they have a 202, and not all of them have a 202, but a 202 means it's an asynchronous response. And so hmm. basically it says, yeah, we got your request and we're working on it. Mm -hmm. But at least in our product, once you get a 202, you then have to poll the system to say, what's my status? Hmm. Because that's the end of that transaction. Once you get the 202, that 
exchange has ended and you have to poll the system. Oh, okay. And and so what I've seen missing, at least in this one, is okay, where does it talk about polling for the status of an asynchronous call? And maybe the others don't have asynchronous calls. It may not matter. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's that's a good call out. And all these positive ones often aren't documented. I mean, you're right. It's like they just assume it's either 200 successful and you're good to go or everything else is a problem. But uh, good point. Um, you know, all of these conceptual topics really are what distinguish good docs, good API docs from bad API docs. And bad API, API docs, they don't document the status and error codes. It's like they may say, well, our status codes uh, align with universal status codes. And if you, if you Google status codes in Wikipedia, um, you'll see that there are hundreds of these things. Uh, it's like they're, they're, you can read through them, right? And do you have to document a 200 okay? Successful, what more do you want me to say? They may, they may say. And yeah, you might not really have much to say about that. But as Greg was pointing out, there are more nuances to a successful request that might be important. And, and what's being overlooked here? But you only want to document the ones your product actually returns. Oh, yeah. And this is a debate we've been having at work is, you know, it's like, okay, guys, which ones do we return? <clears throat> well, we think we... <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you don't, want to, you don't want to document a 202 if your product never returns it because then somebody's going to write code for, some, for an event that's never going to happen. And, and how do you find out the comprehensive list of all the error codes and the status codes? Like you said you've talked to some developers. It's it, it's really uh, it varies. I mean, some people some people might know them. Your QA people might know them. Some people might just be like, well, you kind of have to play around and see what comes back. Like, okay. And then how do you translate all these? But yeah, you you might have to purposefully try to prompt some of these. You know, munge a parameter, see what comes back, and try to try to violate some principle. You know, how many requests can you make? How many times can you hit that send button and just keep making requests and see what happens? Um, it probably is a little overboard to try to do all that, but at the very least, uh, try to prompt a few and, and work with QA because really, like developers should be able to tell you all of the status codes that the system returns. It should be documented. <clears throat> all right. You want a funny digression on that? Sure. I once worked for a software company on a product and we had a customer who demanded to know all the error codes we could issue and no one knew. We paid two programmers for a year to go through the source code and figure out all the possible wow. uh, messages that the product could issue. That's crazy, so that's crazy. The developers, <laughs> it, if they're, yeah. if they're in, you know, doesn't and, always happen. And, and there's you know lots of developers working on the same code base so it, it's, Suddenly, they're being asked to comprehensively define all the error codes across the team. It might be it might be more than we sometimes assume. All right, let's go on to the next core topic. These are all you know specific to API docs, especially this one. API rate limiting and thresholds. If you remember uh, with the Open API Weather Map, one of the first things we looked at was how many times can I make this request? It was 60 per minute. After that, what happens? Well, let's look at our three contenders. GitHub and LinkedIn and Bitly. <clears throat> so take three minutes and tell me which is the best. All right. Which one do you like best out of these three? And of course, it's somewhat unfair to compare them like this because they're different products. Some might have like a lot more to say than others, but in general, you know, it's letting you taste the genre here of the rate limiting topic. So Bitly is the only one that actually tells you how, what your rate limit is. The other two, well, the first one's like, this is what a rate limit is, but it doesn't tell you. Microsoft is, doesn't seem to tell you what it is. And GitHub is just like, here's a bunch of information. Um, and here's how to find your rate limit, I guess, via the command line. So it's hard to compare, but I think Bitly has the, the best one because you can say, oh, this is my rate limit. 
Okay, so it's more specific. Which one has a rate limit for one method? Bitly? <coughs> Ah, oh, you're right. <laughs> V3 slash shorten is their success, their most successful API method. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, good, good point there. Anything else? Any other observations? Greg, or, yeah, Greg? Yeah. Well, the GitHub doesn't seem to be conceptual. I mean, it seems to jump right into what looks like the description of the method. Yeah. I think I might be a little. The rate limit rules link, I believe, gives you more conceptual. So they kind of split this up, and uh, and this is, again, a little bit odd that they would have like the concept in a different spot than the other stuff. But who knows if it makes sense in their system? But yeah, there's. I guess there's a conceptual aspect and then a technical aspect. How do I actually see where I'm at? Anybody else have any? Oh, wait, Gina, you oh, had? Yeah, I just like that Bitly has troubleshooting content. There's remediation steps on what you can do, whether you want to try again later, buy a better package. Yeah. To avoid common causes of rate limiting issues, please read our best practices. And we've got things like cache your API or cache your requests or uh, avoid calling when your page loads, all kinds of things. Um, you know, it depends how big of an issue this is with your API. Maybe with the, the LinkedIn one, it's not really an issue, so they don't really devote much time to it. But yeah, things like, what happens when I exceed my rate limit? Does, does, does my, uh, have I coded in error handling so that whatever I was expecting doesn't suddenly freeze up and everything else is waiting for the response that never comes or and this sort of blends into marketing as well because obviously you're not going to get into like price points and different <laughs> different uh, tiers and so forth of what subscription a person has but you know theoretic or hopefully you could at least link to it or indicate some of it and uh, yeah, I guess Bitly, they, they, <clears throat> although they have a whole bunch of stuff about best practices, they, they actually do note that a lot of people don't seem to uh, experience problems. While rate limits exist, default limits are more than sufficient for most API usage. I read that and I think I'm done with this topic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anybody else have any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have too much to say about this, but it is, it is interesting um, kind of understand how APIs are priced. When I worked at a gamification company, uh, I didn't know how many times people could make requests to get like point counts for different users. And then the marketing group was very transparent or the sales group was transparent. And it was like 0 0.02 cents per call. And it was like, oh, they're making millions of calls a month. So how much does our product actually cost? You can sort of get a sense. All right, API code samples and tutorials. This is another, another core topic that comes in API doc sites. A tutorial on how you use something. It's kind of similar to the, the best, or to the getting started, right? Getting started could be a type of tutorial, but these tend to be more broad in scope, can be any, anything, not necessarily getting started with your product. And there's three examples I've got here. <clears throat> Pi API, Stripe, and Twilio. So take a few minutes, glance at them, and see which one stands out. This might be my favorite topic, actually, sure. now that I think about it. The other ones are pretty straightforward in terms of what to cover, but this one is all over the map again. So which one do you like best? Wait, hold on. I don't need to. I need to balance this out here. We're yeah, here. We're we need to hear some voices we haven't heard yet. Somebody who hasn't spoken. Tell me which one you like. I know there's some quiet people here who have really good insights that are just not sharing them because they're hesitant to. Don't make me call on you. You've all you're all wearing name tags. <laughs> Actually, I can't really read your names because a lot of you use like a ballpoint pen or something. Somebody who hasn't spoken up. I just want to hear your thoughts on. Which one you like best and why? 
putting a lot of pressure on some people. Okay, fine, I won't force it. Anyway, all right, Greg, do you have any thoughts? I really like Stripe because it's annotated. <clears throat> so they're like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's a few lines of code. Now you do this, do this, here's what this is. Here's some more lines of code. Now you do this. So it, it kind of, it walks you through in more of a tutorial fashion. The, uh, the first one, so it's got a nice balance of code with Project concepts. Insight, it's just like here's your code. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a nice it's a nice balance. Um, that sort of introduces this this thing you'll often hear from developers about self-documenting code, right? This idea that code speaks for itself. Why would I need to describe what it's doing? People who understand this are going to automatically understand what's going on. So why describe it, right? Which is not, not always the case by far. Uh, but yeah, the good balance between concepts and code. And how do they get it so their code samples show rollovers? Uh, that's pretty cool. Anyway, sorry, one thing did jump out at me at Stripe that is my pet peeve, and that's this line at the bottom. And that's it. Couldn't be more simple. <laughs> like, okay, that's a... If somebody who struggled with this, you know, <laughs> reads that, they're like, man, I must be pretty dumb if uh, this couldn't be more simple. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, speaking of code, though, this is not something to totally throw under the rug or, or to pass by, but it's nice code formatting. You can really see between these two. Stripe, they've got syntax highlighting, nice white space. They even have numbered stuff. Nice background, whereas the Pi one, it looks like they're still trying to figure out their styling here. You know, it's like, did they not, did they not realize there are these huge, uh, huge amounts of padding before and after, the simple little curl snippets? They do have syntax highlighting, but it's pretty bare bones. Anyway, thoughts? Uh, yes? So, I noticed that on a couple of them, they have some standard um, code that they well, this this gets into another interesting question, and it's probably what makes API docs so fascinating. All the reference stuff that we're talking about is almost the equivalent of documenting a product by going tab by tab and describing what's on the tab. It's not task based, right? It's like, this is what this screen does. This is what this screen does. And we all know that that's not the right way to do things. People, want, people have tasks they want to perform, and they need steps on how to do that. So the reference docs sort of fall short. Problem is, developers say, well, you can use these API endpoints in so many different ways. There's no possible way we could list out the tasks. It's not like a GUI application that has a clear set of tasks you expect a user to do, and then you can document those. It's like uh, you could have 17 different languages and 30 different use cases. So we'll let people mix and match the endpoints and whatever recipes they're trying to cook up. But then you leave people without any clear instruction. They're like, well, how do I use this? So I think you have to identify some common scenarios. For example, Stripe. Obviously, if I have a payment solution, I need to provide a checkout feature on my my site so people check out and actually submit the payment. So maybe they said, okay, if this is your scenario, you're gonna need you need to start by configuring things and then you're gonna use uh, some of these methods at some point, the checkout method. Um, I got sample code, but but yeah it's this it's this area and the part I find interesting is how do you translate reference documentation into actual goals that people have to perform. And then and then how do you narrate that? I'm working on something at work that has taken me forever. Um, because let's say that you're a writer and you have this Stripe thing. And say, they say, uh, Jim, Sally, whatever, uh, I want you to write a tutorial on how to use a checkout with PHP. And you're like, great, OK. First, I'm going to need to build a PHP application in order to actually make something work. Because without it, how do I even know if this code works? Right? I could describe this config file all I want, but I actually need a PHP application and an environment where PHP is installed in order to run this PHP web application. 
So now you've got this crazy scenario where you have to try to describe how to do something, but it's hard as hell to set it up. Like you need an engineering resource or you need to dive into PHP and figure out how to build a web application. And this is not just a simple one, you're making a payment solution with a checkout cart, right? So this is, this is an advanced feature. And the reason I was sort of ranting about this is because at work I'm documenting this thing where it's like uh, they're just describing how to integrate their catalog file into their Android app, right? Like this is fine except for we don't have a sample catalog file and I don't have my sample Android app that has you know, robust streaming media kind of features. And so trying to figure out how you write a tutorial about something that's very difficult to test is what is at the heart of like why it can be a challenge. But it's also the fun part, right? Because once you do have that and you can make it work, you can often test things out. You may, you may in reality get a lot of information from engineers that they review and vet and check against things and tell you, uh, oh yeah, developers would need to know about this much and if we're wrong, we'll definitely hear it back in the beta, betas and so forth. Anybody like Twilio's? Yes, yeah. because uh, they had, had some understanding of the potential use cases. Yeah. They even have a video. Of, I mean, if you don't want to bother to read the steps, you can just scroll down and they say, check out our video. The only thing I didn't like about it was that for each example they give, when you click on an example, or say the programmable SMS quick start, you should be able to navigate from one example to the other. Hmm. Which would be, that's the only thing, not a clicking. They actually have done some interesting research about their tutorials. Um, I linked to a video in, in the course in this same section. You notice that if you dive into one of these things, you only get so far before you get to the bottom and you have to, you have to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. Right? What's next? And it kind of, I think I already clicked through these, but basically you click through the bottom and you, you go to the next one. It's like uh, they're trying to pull you. <laughs> and so and a lot of times, like when you click this, this side will change to show the relevant code. It's not in this example. But you can see very clearly how far a user is progressing through each of these stages of your tutorial. And they did a study and said, well, what? makes a developer get farther along in the tutorial than those who abandon it. What do you think they found? Well, their test was how far up do we put our code samples and how does that affect the depth to which they get through the tutorial? They found that if they put the code samples higher up on the page, people, uh, the tutorials performed better. People got farther along because developers liked code. Maybe this is why they put the design on the right, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, they found that people spent longer on pages that had code higher up. If you have pages that have 11 sentences before the code versus pages that have seven sentences, the pages with just seven sentences had more usage. Um, it's because developers really like code samples. So this probably speaks to the most important part of a code tutorial is samples because they do speak in, in the language of that code and tend to communicate in, in ways that are hard to describe. Um, yeah, the, the code tutorials are hard to do and uh, these, I think Twilio does a great job, Stripe does a great job and uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely part of API docs and they're a more challenging part. Yes? What do you mean? I wish they would use, like, pre I want to know prerequisites. Again, it's like knowing where you are in it. Um, the Twilio, actually, I was excited at the beginning. It says, you will learn how to. Mm. Now, it's a numbered list. And so I'm like, okay, this must be the bits that you stuck to. Yeah. And then they kind of lost that. They wouldn't just, like I said, the narrative. Yeah. And it's like... Oh, you, you're saying you got lost when they went into the narrative and you wanted more of the f adherence to the steps. Yeah. Those bullets. I yeah. agree. I like it that yeah. way, too. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like I'm not reading a book here. I'm, I'm stepping through stuff. Well, uh, yeah. I'm a huge fan of, of the workflow map that Greg was talking about earlier where you have some. He, he's noted the subway map. Others have little workflow boxes. But, yeah, if you can 
pull a user through that, then they know if where, where they are in the process, how long it is, it's got a clear map, and those are, those are actually really easy to do. Um, even in my, I've got some uh, Fire App Builder documentation. This is like a template for building an Android app. Oops, and I landed, why do I go to Chinese? <laughs> have no idea. Why did it think I'm in China? Anyway, uh, but when <clears throat> people are trying to configure their feed, I put these little boxes at the top and say, look, you've got about nine steps here. And as soon as they jump into it, this one highlights. And this is not hard to do in CSS, uh, and it really forces a linear sort of order, which doesn't always reflect things. But um, it is a map, and uh, I have a whole, whole essay on my site about this need for a map, right? If you go hiking, you need a map that shows you the larger process of where you are in the, in the mountains. And then you hike along the trail and you just see the, the trees and the brush, and you kind of glance back between the map that gives you the large view and the micro view, and that orientation is critical when you're navigating a complex information landscape. So good call out there. And um, yeah, all right. Uh, all right, I talked about those two. A few things to remember for code samples beyond what we've already talked about. Focus on the why, not the what. So if you have, you have a code sample, you don't have to describe what it does so much as why you're doing it. Uh, you don't have to describe the mechanics of a programming language. You assume that the person <laughs> understands that. You're describing maybe why you're using a certain method, not oh, we're passing a, uh, an argument into a parameter and this is executing this. It should be apparent. Um, keep them as simple as possible. You don't need to add in extra code and so forth just to make it look pretty. If you can make the code samples copy and paste friendly, great. And then finally, understand which, which language your developers are primarily using. You know, when I worked at a gamification company, most people used JavaScript. So that's why we had a whole JavaScript SDK and sample widgets and so forth, and that's what the code was in, right? So knowing your users helps you narrow that scope. Yep. So I've got a question. This is a debate I've been having with one of our writers where he wants to make the example usable. So he wants to put in error checking code, and he wants to you know, create an object and then read the data into the object and then pass the object. And I'm like, no, just, just, you know, put the, 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 the most minimal example, hard code the, the parameters that you're passing, you know, yeah. make the call and get the response. And I'm just curious what other people's reaction is. Do you feel like the, you know, do you really need a, an extensive sample or just, I always want just a sample that just exercises that one call. I, well, I've actually, I think that definitely the simple one is better. Um, I've seen this a lot actually with my, my Jekyll documentation theme that I built. Uh, behind, this is just like a, a doc theme that uses Jekyll. It's pretty simple code. It's not like super fancy code but people look at it and they're like, oh, now I understand how this works. And they go off and build their own. Or they use it as a starting point and they get something way more complex. But without that simple starting point, it's really hard for people to understand something that begins complex, right? This was Jekyll's philosophy. They, their minimal theme is extremely minimal so that you see at the, this, at, the, at the start, like this is all it really takes. But yeah, the production level is gonna be way more insanely complex. And, um, yeah, did anybody else? Does anybody else have thoughts on simplicity versus complexity in code samples or, or other thoughts? Okay. All right, uh, we have a few more sections here. This is getting into, yes? I hate to be super blunt, but um, in the interest of time, it's already four o'clock. Okay. Maybe we could skip to the, part, the last part? Yeah, the, yeah, why don't we, let me see how many more sections we have here. No, no, I only had three more topics. So maybe it's getting a little weary looking through these. How about I just wrap these ones up in a few minutes and then we move on to the next sure. one. Is that right? And we can take a quick little break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean you didn't want to be here till 8 p.m.? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we probably, is it all right if we end the workshop at 
30-ish, and then I give you a survey on, on different things and sure. so forth? Okay. Uh, the SDKs, this is an important aspect that will probably frustrate you to learn. Um, but AP, the SDK stands for Software Development Kit, and usually it's the programming kit on how you implement an API in a specific language. Could be Android, Java, something else. You usually have to document these, but only at a surface level. The programmer should usually give you this code, and your task is to basically provide a README, what it contains, what it does, how to install it. You don't have to go into great lengths to do this. Um, and there are some samples, but basically the, the problem about these is that they assume more in-depth knowledge of a language, and it's kind of hard. It can be intimidating to suddenly have to document a Node.js SDK without understanding Node, right? Uh, a couple of others that are really handy is one called an API quick reference. These are just one-line descriptions of all the different endpoints in your, in your API. Um, simple example here from Eventful. Here are all of our API methods and in one line what they do, right? The, the, the APIs really lend themselves to this quick reference because now I can quickly scan and see, oh, this is what I'm trying to do and I can jump into that specific section. Um, more than almost any other system, you can easily create a quick reference. Um, you can also do more elaborate stuff, <clears throat> but there. And finally, the glossary. Uh, there are actually some examples of glossaries. A lot of people neglect these, but you'll find that uh, uh, there's more jargon in this space than anywhere else. And when you start to define terms, it helps you almost more than, than anybody else, really. I mean, it helps you clarify what parts are fuzzy and, and really be consistent about terms. So there's more of those on my site, but that is the, that, those are the essence those are the essential conceptual topics that API docs should have. Our two remaining sections are publishing API docs and getting a job in API documentation. I just want to get a sense for which one you're more interested in, in the interest of time. Raise your hand if you want me to go deeper into publishing API docs out of these two. And raise your hand if you want me to go deeper into the job landscape for API docs. Okay, so I'll spend more time on the publishing one. All right, go ahead and take five, six minutes, and then we'll come back.